Okay, welcome to the lecture on chapter four of Father Dominique Barthélemy's book, God in His Image. And the chapter is titled, People Condemned to Liberty. So what we're gonna be talking today is about the relationship between freedom and the law. The law specifically that the Lord gives to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. All right. So let's get started with a brief prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our minds with the light of your truth. Fill our hearts with the fire of your love. Move us from where we are. Change us from who we are. Guide us to where you want us to be. And transform us into your likeness. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So we are reading chapter 4 reading this out of order. Uh, we wanted to skip to chapter four because this is a chapter specifically about the nature of the law that the Lord gives to Moses. Uh, chapter three is more of an all-inclusive chapter about the nature of God's covenants and his covenantal relationship to Israel. But I wanted to sort of dig down into the nature of the law and try to understand why God would give the people he just freed all of these instructions, all of these duties and precepts and commands, and how is it that he could free them and then burden them with all of these duties and tasks? So what's going on there? Father Bartholomew will explore this topic um, and ultimately conclude that all of these laws are in fact conditions for the sort of freedom God intends for the people of Israel. So he begins by an interesting observation that the Israelites, or what we know today as the Jews, have lived among many different people and have always sort of stood out and existed in an uneasy relationship with whatever people they happen to be among, and this bears itself out over and over again in human history. It's hard to deny. So why is it? Why have the Israelites always stood out among those cultures and peoples that they've lived among? One way of getting into this is to talk about the Jewish diaspora. So a diaspora is basically just a spreading out of a particular people among many other different areas. And the Jews come to live among many different peoples for various reasons. Uh, but you would find uh, Jewish people, say, in the Roman times, all over the place, all the way from Spain to Africa uh, and everywhere in between. So one common thread among Jewish people, wherever they find themselves, is that they never completely or totally assimilate to the culture in which they find themselves. Why is that? Well, particularly in the ancient world, one reason might be that they had strict orders never to acknowledge a human master. This is the hypothesis that Father Bartholomew floats in this chapter that has the implication that they can never sacrifice to any power structure that does not acknowledge God the Creator is the ultimate power or authority. Father Bartholomew writes, Israel dispersed among various empires could never offer sacrifice to the power in which those empires believed. Indeed, they were known by the Romans as atheists. And so were the Christians, by the way. It's very intriguing. This was the title that Dio Cassius and other Roman, prominent Roman figures of the time assigned to the Jews. They were atheists because they were the repudiators of the gods. So the way that Romans would approach cultural diversity, religious diversity, is that you know, since they were polytheists, they had a pantheon of gods, if they encounter a new god, they were very open to just simply adding that god to their collection, to their pantheon. Perhaps this is a real god, and maybe we'll find a place for him, a little niche, in our broad collection of gods. Well, for the Jews, if they not only believed that there was really only one God, but that they could only serve that one God, and that the other gods were either evil, 
or just non-existent, then they would not recognize any of those other gods. So they didn't play this game of just adding another god to the collection of gods. And Father Barthelemy mentions in this connection the eventual phrase or motto of Muhammad, uh, founder of another great monotheistic faith, Islam. There is no God but God. The way that it's translated here is there is no divinity other than God. Uh, this is kind of a rallying cry or, or central tenet of Islam. What it basically means is that once there is the one God, the God of heaven and earth, the one who created everything, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there can't be any other ones. They all have to go. And the Romans and other ancient peoples focused more on that. All the other gods have to go. So get your other gods out of here than the fact that uh, Jews did really believe in a divine being. It just happened to be one single, all-encompassing divine being. Then Father Bartholomew goes into a, more of a psychological reality. He makes the observation that everyone has an ultimate authority in their life. Everyone, in a sense, serves a master. And the one who refuses to place themselves under the authority of God doesn't avoid serving something, doesn't avoid imbuing ultimate authority to something beyond themselves, but just goes on a quest and often can become vulnerable to exploitation from some power that assumes authority over that person. But it's almost an inevitable human reality that we have to place ourselves in the service of something greater than ourselves. We cannot indefinitely maintain the illusion that we control the world. He writes, as soon as man no longer recognizes his power or fails to discover it, other powers, existent or non-existent, enter into play. Why is that? Man feels the need of giving himself a master so as not to be tormented by the emptiness and vagueness of a condition that opens itself, opens everything up before him, but does not point out his way, leaving him in indecision and ignorance. So in other words, without some sort of external authority that we serve that's greater than ourselves, we ultimately end up spinning like a top. It becomes pointless or meaningless. So all of us eventually have to imbue ultimate power in something beyond ourselves. The question is, what will that be? And Father Bartholomew writes, there is only one power that can impose himself on the whole of creation without violating any part of it, the power by which creation itself exists in the fullness of its liberty. But what does he mean by that? I think what he means is that we usually experience the imposition of authority as a disruption, a violation, something external, what, what Immanuel Kant would call heteronomy, law from without. So this is kind of disruptive and you feel at odds with it. But if you are given a law by that which made you, it's going to fit. So this is why I put the image of the watchmaker fixing the watch down there. Because in a sense, he's imposing his authority upon the watch, not only in terms of how it works, but also how he's going to fix it. And it's only if that watch accedes to this authority that it can then function in the way that it was meant to function, and in this sense, be free. And so this gets us into the weeds of alternative understandings of freedom. It is very important, but it's a, it's a bit philosophical. So Father Bartelli is basically saying there's really two dimensions of liberty positive and negative. What the famous philosopher Isaiah Berlin called the freedom of the fox and the freedom of the hedgehog. Maybe you'll see why in a second. Father Bartholomew makes the bold claim though at the beginning that liberty is not just the shaking off of bonds that browbeat and disfigure man's real development, but that it also implies the possibility of realizing far more deeply the reason for one's existence, of discovering one's real meaning, of reaching one's goal. So the freedom of the hedgehog is the freedom of uh, negation, of a sphere of immunity in which you keep others away, you keep the forces that conflict with your goals and ends away. That's the negative freedom. Freedom of the fox, however, is the ability or capacity 
to go about realizing your goals or ends. So the two pictures I have on the left there kind of illustrate this. If you're a pianist, you're not free if you're in chains, right? You can't do much of anything. First step is to break the chains and establish freedom of movement, but that's only the first step. There's the positive freedom of being able to complete or realize your potential by actually performing on the piano, doing what you can and want to do. So there's freedom from, freedom for. Freedom from is the negative freedom, freedom for the positive freedom. Bartholomew's point is that emancipation, which is what we usually associate solely with liberty, it's only the door to true freedom. It's only the departure point. It's only the first step. True freedom is really the realization of a capacity or the fulfillment of a purpose. So it's really the difference between removing an obstacle to your freedom of movement and then realizing your freedom of movement completely by maximizing your capacities or action. Okay, so it raises the question though, what is our freedom for in the end? Well, we've already established the basic premise that we long to belong to something bigger than ourselves. So what is that something? That's really the question. And Bartholomew's theological claim here is that that something which is preferable to solitude may be the grinding system of the totalitarian state. Even if it crushes him, it frees man from that obscure giddiness of his useless nothingness. It's sort of a modern political point to highlight that this something may not be something that's in our best interest. It may be something that's grinding us down and oppressing us. But only if we are using our freedom for something that will unlock our full potential, what we were meant to be, our purpose in existing, will our freedom truly blossom. But at the same time, we would almost rather be in the service of something that crushes us and oppresses us if it gives us this illusion of belonging to something bigger than ourselves. But this is the drama that Israel faces. Is it going to serve and place itself under the authority of a God who will shape it and unlock it and give it the capacity to act in the way that humans were created to act? Or will it turn to alternative masters, which will give it the illusion of autonomy and self-direction, but will really stunt it, will make it distorted and ultimately amount to meaninglessness? Okay, so Israel is faced with a stark alternative. And it's the exodus that really breaks down the illusion that human beings can really be the ultimate authority in the world. Because they witnessed the power of God over all of the most powerful figures that was in the, were ancient, in the ancient world at that time, Pharaoh and the Egyptian regime. So after the Exodus, Israel can no longer uh, pretend that the ultimate authority lies with human beings and their claims to be the gods of the world or the representatives of the gods in the world. They can no longer find their purpose within human structures of power alone. So what's the alternative for them? Well, God requires of Israel either solitude and thirst or else happy development in his hands, Father Bartholomew says. There is no third possibility. They can't go and establish some earthly structure that they can then say is the ultimate power authority in the world. They are either left on their own or they're in the hands of God. So they're faced with the hardest of demands, either accepting God's ultimate authority or really having nowhere else to go. But it's that lack of an option that allows them to stay within God's grasp, Father Bartholomew suggests. It allows them to keep coming back because God has disabused them of this temptation to turn to earthly powers as the source of ultimate authority in the world. The Ten Commandments are designed to keep Israel 
from becoming vulnerable to the conditions that they experienced in Egypt, conditions of slavery. And he says there's really two types of slavery that the law prevents. There's the exterior type, from without, so we're talking about conquest from foreign peoples, subjugation to foreign empires, and all the oppression and persecution that comes with that. So it's preserving the integrity of the people so that they can remain a people and independent, but it also preserves them from a slavery within the society. So the master-slave relationships that tend to emerge even within a nation and culture that those forms of internal inequality and injustice that can very quickly produce a, a subordinate class of people, a subjected people. That's what the law is really designed to head off. So in the next section, the people's immediate dependence on God, Father Bartholomew talks about the different situations that Israel finds itself in and how this affects their overall relationship to God. So when all goes well, the temptation is to see nature as a trustworthy nurse. I really like that phrase, Father Bartholomew's. In other words, you can turn from a direct dependence upon that which transcends the world to a dependence upon just the mechanics and natural laws and dynamics of the world. So when you enter into this mentality of just really relying upon the regularity of nature, you can often begin to take everyday miracles for granted. I like the way that he puts this. At times like these, when the Savior does not have to enter in on the scene to snatch his people from the abyss, there is a tendency for, to forget that every dawn is a daily salvation, a new gift. There is the tendency to think that it is perfectly normal for the stalk to come from the seed, for the baby to come from the womb, for the adult to grow out of the baby, and that such is the drama of everyday life. So short-sighted does man tend to become. We fail to see how wondrous and miraculous the everyday occurrences of this world are. We uh, become desensitized to their gratuity, that they're a gift. And so Father Bartholomew will say, in the short-sightedness of a prosperous life, man fails to look at its real author. So they fail to connect the everyday occurrences in the world with the God who is directing them. And so the things that happen in the world no longer have this immediate relationship to the transcendent source and origin of them, but just sort of have an internal regularity. And in that perspective, this living faith, this living relationship to a living God can descend into superstition or even idolatry. Well, how does this happen? Well, first of all, God fades into the background and he becomes more of the one who undergirds or justifies all the things that happen. So he becomes docile, he becomes domesticated. And then when we regularize God and tame him, God becomes more like a machine or somebody who just makes sure nothing goes wrong. He's fading back into the picture. We begin to remember this more active God, this living God, but then we contort him into what we want to, we want him to be. We begin to remember God as we want to remember him. He starts to find a place in our lives, the way that we want our lives to go, and we no longer place ourselves at the disposal of God and allow our lives to fit into God's plan. This is a chief dynamic of the drama of salvation. Do our lives fit into God's plan, or do we fit God into our plans? Well, when times are going uh, well, when things are going well, we oftentimes fit God into the plans and goals for our life. And then forgetting leads to a sort of self-projection. We begin to reimagine that voice we heard so long ago that directed us in unpredictable ways, and we begin to wonder, did we invent that voice? And we begin to wonder, are we inventing our idea of who God is now? So we begin to lose hold of this direct connection to God that often occurs in times of crisis, or times of distress. But in those days of distress, after you have descended into this superstition or this domestication of God, the imagined projections prove useless. And the idols that we've created for ourselves in place of the real God fade away because they can't do anything. And so we begin to remember again that real living God 
But coming with that is also the sense of danger, the sense of unpredictability, uncertainty. And this is, uh, you know, this can often be dis discomforting. Um, it can lead to unease. So we don't know what's, what's happening. And uh, in this connection, Father Bartholomew says that the holiness of encountering God kind of has this twofold dimension. Like fire, it can warm and give life and fulfillment and joy. Or it can burn and consume and destroy. It's this characteristic of being around this force that can have this life-giving effect, but also this destructive effect that is a sign that you are actually engaging with the real living God. The laws are meant to sustain this perspective on God. They're meant to instill a sense of continual remembrance of who God is and a continual sense of attentiveness and disposition toward doing whatever God might request of fitting our lives into God's plan rather than vice versa. So to attend to God to daily life, the people have to fear God. That doesn't necessarily mean being uh, terrified. It means to always have God in mind, to continually rely on and revere God, to have a proper sense of who God is at all times, and not to be tempted into those self-projections, the figments of the imagination. Father Bartholomew quotes this first century rabbi, Yohanan ben Zakkai here, who at his, on his deathbed says this, God grant that his fear may be as vivid a reality within you as the fear of men. It's sort of a stark way of putting it. Do you fear God or do you regard God in the same way that you regard the possible uh, uh, reactions and consequences that come from human beings? You navigate the world as if what God thinks matters as much as what other people do. It's an um, interesting and um, bold challenge. But that's what the law is trying to instill in the people, that sort of continual mindfulness. They care as much about what God will think of what they do as what other people will think of what they do. So one of the things that's meant to keep this continual remembrance in mind is the land Sabbath. So there's a law that says every seventh year, you have to leave your crops fields, crop fields fallow. You can't cultivate those fields. What's the logic behind that? Well, besides being you know, in accordance with the whole Sabbath rhythm, it's meant to give back these fields into the hands of their creator. Uh, in terms of uh, economically, socially, it's meant to emphasize that ownership is always provisional. It's always transient. The law belongs to God. So every seventh year, you have to give it back to God to do what God wants to do with it. This also has a kind of ecological dimension to it. This is rest for the land. Just as every seventh day is rest for human beings, every seventh year is rest for the land. You're giving it back to its true owner so that he might restore it and revitalize it. So the presumption is not there that uh, we can do whatever we want with the world and it will always bounce back. There's this really uh, prudent and, and humble sense that we have to let the land rest. We have to let God work with it uh, if it's going to be fruitful for us. It also drills into the people a sense of radical dependence because what are they going to do for that year? They depend on that food that they grow in the field, right? They have to trust that God will provide enough surplus in those off years, especially in that sixth year, that it will get them through both the seventh year and then the next year when the land is uh, coming back. Um, so it actually takes two years for the crop to come back in. And this is meant to help them to remember that you're just passing through here. You're strangers and sojourners with me, the Lord says in the book of Leviticus. Um, don't get too attached. This isn't your true home. You have to uh, be in constant relation with me, even in your dealings with the land. There's also these laws that have to do with offering the first fruits of everything, including your children. Every firstborn child and animal belongs to the Lord. They don't kill every firstborn child, of course, but they have to offer a sacrifice. They have to redeem every firstborn child by killing an animal in its place. And every firstborn male animal they also sacrifice to the Lord. 
Uh, so this is meant to sort of place God first by giving him the first and the best of what they have. It's also a sense of dependence because they trust that God will give them enough, even with that sacrifice. Also with the harvest, the first fruits of the harvest has to have to be given back to God. And there's this feast called Shavuot, where it's the harvest feast, one of the high holy days, where they offer the first fruits of the harvest back to the Lord. Now, the principle underlying all this is that the first of everything, even if symbolically, must be for God, and only then may man make use of it. And the broader principle is that all that we have is from God. It's a gift. And it's given to us for a purpose. So it's not just purely for our enjoyment. It's meant to facilitate the purpose that God has for us in the world, and particularly for Israel, as the chosen people, as the kingdom of priests that's meant to mediate God to the world. So Bar Bartholomew concludes, all these observances keep vividly before Israel's mind the fact that there is no human power that has not been conferred by God. So for them, they're never tempted to place the absolute power of God into the hands of a single ruler, like the Egyptians and many other ancient empires. Because they have these practices that constantly remind them that God is in charge. God is the ultimate ruler. God is the ultimate gift giver. We give everything first and foremost to God. So it's a different way of organizing their common life together. And it's a social world that is designed to preserve the conditions for liberty. So we've already established that continual dependence on God is really the only way to remain truly free because everyone has to serve someone or something who will either be the creator who knows you and knows what will unlock fully your potential and give you that freedom of a joyful uh, fulfillment of your purpose, or you'll serve another creature whose purposes may or may not be in sync with yours, most likely not. You'll be either exploited by another creature by another person or social system, or you'll be in the hands of the creator who will uh, want you to flourish fully. So serving the Lord alone is really the only way to prevent the sort of exploitation and slavery that ultimately come when one creature is master of another. That's really the thing to avoid here. One human being or one creature being a master over another. That's the primary disorder that these laws are meant to fix. Nobody shall exploit his brother. Father Bartholomew has a nice definition of exploitation here. It means to treat a brother as an object from which one expects a return. There you have really isolated the, I think, the core moral evil of slavery, treating a human as a commodity, reducing a who into a what a person, a brother or sister, into an object that you can exploit, make money from, get some return from. So the reason that nobody shall exploit his brother is that all Israel is made up of persons who have been freed. And to turn anyone into a slave would be to disfigure them, would be to contradict their identity. Israel is a community of freed slaves. That's who they are, and these laws are meant to preserve that identity and get them to remember it so that they will not then repeat or recapitulate that very form of exploitation that they suffered in Egypt. This is why the Lord is always there saying, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Remember that you were slaves. Israel knows what slavery is like. And just like this uh, motto in the wake of the Holocaust, you could apply it all the way back to Exodus as a kind of motto for the law that Moses gives to the people. Never again, never again will it be like this among you or between you and other people. So in order to do that, you have to pull up the systemic roots of slavery. First of all, they prohibit usury or placing interest on loans. Now, it is true that this only applies within the people of Israel, but it's extremely important to preserve anyone within the people of Israel from getting to the point where they are so indebted that there's nothing left that they can sell except themselves. This is the most common way in the ancient world that 
person became a slave. Second most common would be as if you were conquered in war, but the most common would be you are so poor that you have no way to pay back your debts and so you have to sell yourself into slavery. Related then, no forced labor. So you can't do this. The reason why you don't charge interest is so that nobody gets to the point where they have to sell their labor indefinitely sometimes in order to satisfy a debt. And related to this then, even if somebody does get to this point where they have to sell themselves, there's only a sick, there, there's a maximum to it. Now this applies to um, people who find themselves in the position of servitude and it's important that they put a limit on it even though the slave themselves could voluntarily exceed that limit. The principle, again, is that the people belong to the Lord. So Israel is the servant of the Lord. And the servant of the Lord cannot then make another person a servant. And from the other way around, don't therefore make yourself a servant of a servant. This is another quote from Rabbi Yohanan Zakkai. Let them therefore not make themselves slaves of slaves. All of Israel, in a sense, is slave to the Lord. It's inappropriate then for people to be slaves to those slaves. Remember that you were slaves, and in a sense, now you serve the Lord, and that's why you can be free. There's also interesting limits on debt collection. So you can't take somebody's millstone, because then they have no way to make bread. You can't take somebody's last cloak or piece of clothing, because what will they uh, use to keep warm? You can't go into somebody's house and seize things from them to pay a debt. So you cannot exact a uh, debt that's owed at the cost of the person's life, livelihood, or dignity. There's a limit to what you can do. People are not allowed to sell their lives, their selves. So it's interesting. There's some things that cannot be bartered or taken as a part of a financial transaction. All right. So in this connection too, there's laws that are meant to prevent permanent economic inequality. And this is one of the most interesting, the laws regarding the cancellation of debts, which amount to really a prearranged socioeconomic reset. And maybe I'll uh, uh, make clear what that, what that really refers to. So every seven years, there is an annulment of all debts and the return of all pledges. To think of that, how would our current credit card system work in this system? Well, it wouldn't, right? You'd basically be saying, well, you can have credit, you can have loans, you can have a whole financial system, but after the sixth year, every debt is canceled. And every pledge that was taken, you know, like a collateral, you have to return it. And we start over again. So the financial system of loans and everything is premised on that, gets reset after seven years. This is one of the laws of God given to Moses. It's pretty radical. Even more radical is the Jubilee year law. Every 50 years, all patrimonial land allotments are to be restored. And what does that mean? So there was an original allotment of land to the different tribes of Israel and within the different tribes, land allotments to the different families. <clears throat> And so things are kind of set initially. And then within 50 years, you have buying and selling of land. You have people gaining wealth and power and privilege. And then after 50 years, it all goes back to the way it was when it started. So it's basically a socioeconomic revolution built into the laws of Israel every 50 years. Every half century, the whole socioeconomic hierarchy dissolves and begins again. It's really fascinating. Now, we don't have any evidence that this was regularly practiced. And you can understand why, like how could this work? But we do have evidence from the prophets that Israel is punished for not practicing it. And there's also evidence that this ideal of every so often resetting things so that the idea is that these arrangements and hierarchies that we create within each other, between each other, are not permanent. They're only temporary. 
there's only one person who ultimately owns all things. We're just playing around with them, temporarily renting them, loaning them to each other, but they ultimately belong to someone higher. So it's a built-in revolution. No indefinite accumulation of wealth, privilege, and power. No dynastic oligarchies. Every 50 years, things go back to the way they were initially. All this legislation, Father Bartholomew writes, shows how deeply the biblical legislators were concerned with rooting out slavery in Israel. What's the connection there? Well, the idea is that part of the root of slavery is persistent, maybe even growing, economic inequalities and the structures that enable that economic inequality. And then that economic inequality ultimately leads to the point where some people are so destitute that they basically live in slavery. And if you think this was only from past generations of human history, there's a subset of people, particularly in Brazil, South America, that live this reality today. Now it's not like chattel slavery or racially based slavery like we experience in this country, but it's a system of forced labor where people are lured out into the Amazon and are forced to work. And then they're not paid enough to pay off the debts for what they're charged for their food, clothing, and shelter. They have to work more and more and more. They get more and more in debt. They're basically slaves. It's forced labor or indentured servitude. This goes on today. In fact, you know, according to the United Nations, Amnesty International, and even the Catholic uh, uh, churches, uh, numbering there are more slaves today than there ever have been at one time in human history. If you count people who are in a situation of debt, poverty, and servitude or forced labor that they can't get out of, if that's the definition of slavery, then there's a lot of slaves still around today. And it's more of an economic, socioeconomic phenomenon. So the law was meant to protect the poor from slavery. How? Well, it mandates that you give your workers wages daily, pay them at the end of the day. There's the Sabbath, which is also very radical. The Sabbath was for everyone, for workers, employees, and employers alike. Also, animals had to rest on the Sabbath. So you have a day in which you cannot exploit anybody else. You have a day in which everyone gets to rest and rejuvenate, preserves the dignity of workers. You know, they can spend time with the family. They can develop their own culture. They can have recreation, rejuvenation, etc. The Sabbath day was meant to protect the poor from degradation. The harvester must also leave some of the crops or fruit for the poor to gather. This was called gleaning. You weren't allowed to be so efficient with your harvesting that you left nothing behind. You had to leave some on the edges, and that was for the poor. This was also the case for olive groves and for vineyards. You had to leave some of the olives and grapes behind for the poor, particularly the unripe ones, which would eventually ripen and the poor would come and get them. The poor could also eat from a field or orchard as they passed through it. They couldn't accumulate any of the produce and take it with them. That would be stealing. But as they were passing through, they could just pick an olive, pick a grape, pick some of the wheat. And Jesus himself did this in the Gospels as he was passing through a wheat field. So the, t the um, farmers also had to give 10% of the harvest every three years to the poor. So there was mandated charity to the poor among the people. So this was, again, meant to protect the poor from getting so poor that they were vulnerable to conditions of slavery. And Father Bartholomew, at the end, calls this whole set of laws, socioeconomic laws, a well-built jurisprudence to prevent any Israelite from having one of his brethren for master, so that all may only have for master the unique master who made them all brethren. Uh, this is one of the examples of these gems that Father Bartholomew crafts from time to time. A beautiful sentence expressing the whole core, the moral and theological core behind all of these different laws that are given um, in the Torah to help shape the people's life together and to help keep them uh, constantly in mind and dependent on God and in right relationship with one another. <clears throat> okay, that's it for today, and uh, we'll see you guys in class. Thanks.